Uh, well, thanks a lot. I'm excited to be here today. My name is Hernan Alvarez. I'm the VP of Product at Algorithmia. And today I want to talk to you about the challenges uh, that companies often face when trying to realize the benefits of their data science teams and getting those models into production. So last year, uh, Algorithmia, sur sur Algorithmia surveyed more than 500 data scientists to get the pulse of the industry. And we found that the majority of the data scientists' time was spent on things other than data science. Uh, surprisingly, data scientists spent 75% of their time on processes and infrastructure, which is really a, a waste of their time, uh, impacts productivity, makes them unhappy, and really the data scientists probably shouldn't be the team focused on, uh, focused on uh, infrastructure. Get my slides going here. All right. Uh, and so we looked at the, the cohort of, uh, of analysis and we found that 30% uh, of the teams were spending most of their time managing their tooling, the different frameworks and languages. And another 30% were spent uh, managing uh, the, the workflow itself, uh, such as versioning. Uh, but the lion's share of the time was spent on deploying models. 38% of the respondents said they spent most of their time deploying models. And so we, we obviously have a solution for that and we, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But let's dive into a little bit more about why that happens. So uh, isn't this a solved problem? Isn't, aren't models just code? Well, we have decades of history around software development uh, and traditional software. But, uh, but machine learning is a bit different. Uh, it's, in traditional software, uh, we, we move, with traditional software, we kind of think about upgrades in a, in, a, in a cycle that involves you know, bug fixes and performance updates and whatnot. In a world of machine learning, uh, often those traditional applications will be consuming the inference from those systems. And machine learning is about selecting the right tool for a given job. Uh, a data scientist might select uh, Python or Scala or R for one particular model and then a completely different language for another model. And then within, within a given framework, uh, within those uh, given languages, there's multiple frameworks, such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Scikit all work with Python. Uh, but they're, they're tuned for specific types of operations, and they output a different type of model. This creates challenges not only for the, da for the data scientist teams, but downstream of the DevOps teams. And then uh, the landscape's really changed. Um, over the years, applications have become more composable built from multiple components rather than monolithic code. And the service-oriented architecture and microservices have moved application development from uh, an artisanal journey to one more of a modular assembly line. And machine learning is often about choice. It's the, it's the right language, the right framework, the right hardware. You look at this, uh, this example on the screen here. A uh, PR company wants to be able to use machine learning to identify negative reports and news about their particular client. They, they might load the scan documents into an OCR model. That gets passed to a, a language identifier. Non-English language gets translated in another model. That goes through a vectorization model that gets ultimately passed to sentiment analysis so they can score that text. Well, it's a long pipeline of, of different models and different systems that, that create all kinds of challenges. Each one of these models could have been built by a different team with a different underlying framework and a different language. So, <coughs> There's other issues that, that come into play here as well. You know, performance in traditional software development is, is really based around, around execution metrics. Now, more data, faster throughput, lower latency. With ML, you know, it's a multidimensional problem. You have to take into account uh, different new kinds of metrics. They have vectors like accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, and precision. So for example, if you want to do real-time real fraud scoring, you might need a latency requirement of under 30 milliseconds, but you're willing to accept from false negatives. But if you're do, using a similar model uh, for forensic analysis, you might be willing to accept any kind of runtime, but you want to make sure that you're getting all the positives. And then uh, iteration uh, is another, another cha challenge. So uh, machine learning iterates very differently than, than uh, traditional software. Iteration with software, as we said earlier, was really focused on features and bug fixes and performance enhancements. In machine learning, uh, the, out, the output is an evolving ecosystem. Inference made by the interaction of, of your model uh, with live and often unpredictable data. This interaction with, with this new data can cause model drift and affect accuracy, requiring constant tuning and, and retraining. 
This creates challenges for the DevOps team. You have to be extremely agile in your development processes, your operational processes. All right. And then the infrastructure is another challenge for, for teams. So the, the, the software development lifecycle life um, ha- follows a very traditional sort of build, deploy, and, and maintain on a, on a constant set of hardware and a constant set of infrastructure. With machine learning, we introduce a, a completely new stage called the training stage. Uh, in between the functional code completion, the model itself, and then the, and then the deployment. So the training is an iterative process that, that, uh, that, we, that go, we go through constantly to create, increase the accuracy of the model. And they have two very different consumption uh, behaviors. In training, it's, it's long compute cycles, fixed load, it's often a single user, and there's often concurrent experiments on a single model. Once those models are pushed towards pushed push to pr- production, you get really elastic, br- really elastic uh, consumption patterns, high bursts, high concurrency, many users accessing many different models. Uh, and then, uh, perf- and then capacity planning. Uh, traditional capacity planning involves uh, scaling up the infrastructure to meet your in- your peak anticipated demands. This is, ex- this is expensive uh, and it creates a very rigid environment. It doesn't allow it to, to flex up and down with the different workloads and is expense- uh, expensive, as we said. So if we say $25,000 a month for this particular, for this particular infrastructure, um, you know, we know that it's going to be a constant fixed cost and it's very inelastic, inelastic, excuse me. Then with traditional auto scaling, you're really focused on, uh, you're really focused on step step functions to be able to scale up the machines. While this does save about 50% month over month uh, against uh, to the traditional model, it, this, this model struggles in a, in a multi-dimensional deployment st- uh, environment with, m- with GPUs and CPUs, for instance, where you're sc- having to scale those up along those same step functions. So serverless really is the ideal state for model deployment where you can scale, you can scale it up on demand. Uh, the models only instantiate when they're required. Long-running models can, can stay stateful, and, and, uh, and the infrastructure um, is really ultimately flexible to the, to the company's uh, consumption. And then uh, audibility and governance. We had a, a great speaker who was up here a few minutes ago, talked a lot about uh, governance and then uh, and also the ethics around machine learning, which I'm definitely not going to dive into. Um, but uh, we still need to know what's happening with the models themselves. So. Um, in, the, in the world where machine learning models are black boxes producing predictions and judgments without obvious explainability, um, it introduces a number of potential compliance and security concerns. Um, some regions, a uh, customer that's flagged as a credit risk has a, has a right to know why. Uh, and gov- or gov- government auditors um, might need to be able to verify whether or not a model's access sensitive, sensitive data. So um, we need to be able to understand who called what model, what the output was, what data accessed, and when did that happen. So these are, these are things that often we're not thinking about um, as we're producing the models. It has to be thought about very deeply in terms of the model consumption. Uh, and then uh, enterprise. For machine learning models to be readily consumed by the enterprise, they have to be thought about a little bit differently. Um, different than they are often in academic situations. Discoverability and the model management itself um, we need to understand uh, who is producing what model, what version are they at, has it been iterated, can you continue to use that in your business process. Um, you know, auditing and logging, back to the governance and compliance. And uh, additionally, we need to be able to support uh, new languages and, and libraries and new hardware, the latest GPU. Elasticity and concurrency, as we saw on an earlier slide, is another big, big factor in that. Uh, as well as automatic API generation for pipelining. So as we saw with the example of the PR firm, we're stitching together complex ecosystems of models and systems. It all has to be driven by API to make it even remotely manageable. And at the, at the end of it, uh, we also have to have security. Uh, any, any, any modern company has to think about security as a first order problem, not a last order problem. So uh, machine learning is different. Uh, but you can, you can borrow from your team's best practices and leverage, the, leverage what you have today in terms of uh, software development practices and data science practices. Um, while it does, it does iterate much faster and at a different rate than software development, we need to treat that as a feature as we're able to increase model accuracy um, continuously to improve the business. 
Uh, and then ultimately you need to be able to abstract the infrastructure and the components away from uh, the data scientists. The data scientists should really be focused on data science, um, not on what version of Kubernetes they're running on or uh, what, what cloud provider this is at or, or whatnot. They should be focused on building accurate models. And companies that focus on the challenges that we, who we just laid out um, will better their business. Machine learning is obviously, um, is obviously proving to be very valuable in every business. Uh, and for, them, for people to be able to realize that benefit, they need to tackle these challenges. And uh, I would be remiss if I didn't put a sales uh, slide up here. Um, I, think I would think it would go in my performance report. Um, so um, Algorithmia can help you with that, with that journey. We extend human potential with the AI layer. Really it's a machine learning, it's an operating system for machine learning. So we can deploy models from a variety of different frameworks, languages, platforms, and tools. Uh, we can connect with popular data sources, orchestration engines, and step functions. And we can scale this out on multiple infrastructure providers. Um, and then we have tools to deal with the auditing, governance, and security of these models over time, which is really important as, you, as, you, as these mature in the business. Uh, so what I would say to do is go to www.algorithmia.com. It's free to sign up. Um, we have a table downstairs with, that's staffed by Sherwin, who would love to talk to you about, uh, about getting, a, getting a demo for you. And then uh, there is the obligatory we're hiring slide. Uh, everyone, everyone should have one up. Um, we, we have an amazing team, and if you are into uh, large-scale cloud problems and machine learning, we'd love to have you on our team. So thank you very much. It was quick and easy.